All right, so wherever you're at today, whether you're driving down the road to a sales call, whether you're about to pick up the phone to call one of your potential customers, maybe you're walking into a boardroom meeting about to finalize a deal with the company. Heck, in our day and age, maybe you're doing that on Zoom or Skype right now. Wherever you are right now, I want you to stop and think about what I'm about to ask you. What does it actually take for you, listening to me right now, to be a top 1% salesperson in your industry? The salesperson who makes all the money, the salesperson who really gets any promotion they want. In fact, if they don't like the promotion, they turn it down. They have all the respect from management and ownership in that company. The salesperson who leads by example, not because they're cool, because they outperform every other sales rep in that company. Well, my next guest is going to help answer that question for you. And let me give you a small taste of this gentleman's background all the way over from Europe. He has a strong passion for sales and marketing, 25 years experience in the software space and is always looking for new ways to achieve improved business results using innovative software skills and processes, which we're really going to dive into. He's the author of the book, Stop Killing Deals. All right, we got to figure out how you came up with that. I love that. And he's the founder and CEO of Membrane. I think we actually use that service, the sales enablement CRM based out of Stockholm, Sweden. Since 2012, his team at Membrane has collected collaborated with thought leaders and studied research to identify the success factors behind successful sales organizations. The result of their diligence is a software as a service that makes it easier for companies to capture, learn, and execute the behaviors needed to achieve sales greatness. He is an avid blogger. He shares his thoughts on the award-winning blog, The Art and Science of Complex Sales. Please help welcome to the show, Mr. George Brontian, George. Did I Hi there. That? Right. Good to be here. You know, I just read that again and I'm like, I think we use that service. I, I always see that bill coming across uh, every month in my emails and I'm pretty sure we're one of your clients. I just found out. Uh, that's awesome. And I, <laughs> I hope you read that bill with a smile on your face. Oh yeah. I mean, if, if, if it's something that, that we're using for the last three years, it must be good. It must be working right? All right. So, hey, I'm excited to have you on here. And I love talking about human behavior and how that really works in sales and leadership and sales processes and how that applies to really being a top salesperson. So let's do this. I'm gonna, I want to dive right into your background and your story and kind of give our listeners a feel for really how you arrived at this point you're, where you're an elite authority on sales, on complex selling. Maybe tell us a little bit about your background and how this started for you? Like, how did you learn all these skills? Sure thing. Yeah. Well, I guess just through the hard knocks of life, right? Uh, I, I started selling, I guess I, I started uh, as a kid in, in, on my blog, fixing bikes and stuff like that. But as a profession, I started in a company that sold, let's see what I started first. So I think the first job was actually selling loudspeakers. Okay. Uh, and was one of the, it was a pretty cool company here locally in Sweden. They, they were almost like Ikea for loudspeakers. So you actually had to build the loudspeakers yourself. Okay. And, uh, and this was in my teens and, and, uh, or uh, yeah, after school. Yeah. And I just loved everything that had to do with sound. You know, I'm a real sound nerd and all that good stuff. Uh, <laughs> and it was really fun to sell those loudspeakers because you were, you were really selling to other nerds, right? They yeah. came in and they wanted to know what's the best kit and, and sure. you could have a great uh, dialogue. And, and hopefully they went from the shop with a, with a new set of speakers they could build. Yeah. So that was my first experience. And then I started selling books. Uh, so I sold these dummies books for dummies, you know, computers for dummies, right, PC for right. dummies. the whole series. Yeah. Uh, and, and that led me to, uh, to a, a point where they wanted me to become a sales manager. Yeah. With less salary, less sort of freedom as I saw it and, yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah. So I quit that job and started my first company, which led to my second company, which was where I sort of went into a mode of just 
failing a lot <laughs> to be to be quite frank i yeah. i sold in that company called upstream uh, yeah. which i love by the way that's sort of in my dna to sort of challenge the mainstream which is sure. why we call the, the company upstream and when we sold it software to value-added resellers and i wanted to scale it up so i started hiring salespeople. yeah and I started firing salespeople. Right, right. <laughs> and I hired and I fired a lot of salespeople yeah. until I, I had to sit down and just think about that. Who, who was the problem here? What was the problem? And unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, I realized that I, I was the problem, of course. Sure. So that's how I came to this company, which okay. uh, now is Membrane. And, and yeah. be, because, I don't know if I'm an authority, but really nerding down on sales yeah. over the last decade what makes a good sales organization? I think mm. I've been spending a lot of time on not just what makes me good as a salesperson or what makes a salesperson really stand out, but how can we, as a company, build yeah. a, a, a really How can we duplicate team? that success company-wide, not just a few sales yeah. people? Now, yeah. I was on your website earlier. Let's talk a little bit about your book, Stop Killing Deals. First of all, mm -hmm. I, I love that phrase. I think that's amazing. Now, in my mind, I've, I feel like I know who you wrote the book for, but maybe I don't. Who was the book written for and really why did you write it in the first place? Yeah, the book is really based on that story I, I, I gave you briefly now, my own experiences and, and my own mistakes. And, and I realized that a lot of those mistakes that I made were because I held faulty assumptions and faulty beliefs. I thought that selling is something you're born to do. Mm, right. Either you have it or you don't. A gift of the gab. Uh-huh. Yep. And, and good salespeople were of a certain kind. They were, I mean, extroverted, uh, talkative, sure. uh, winners and all that good stuff that, that yeah. we've learned to believe sometimes. Yeah. And of course, my conclusion was that that's not true. It all depends on who your customer are, what you're selling, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. So mm -hmm. Stop Killing Deals came from, from those experiences and that we have to look at the humans. I mean, the yeah. humans are sellers, humans sure. are buyers, right? Yeah. So we can't make these assumptions about yeah. that. Well, we, we have to learn skills that like we talk about that work with human behavior mm -hmm. rather than work against human behavior. Let me give you an example. So my background is behavioral science. I went to school for behavioral science, human psychology. So the moment you start talking to a prospect within the first 30 to 45 seconds, especially, it doesn't matter if it's a cold call, if it's B2B, B2C, doesn't matter if it's in person, inbound, outbound lead. Your prospect is looking for social cues in their mind. This is just how their mind works, how our minds work. They look for social cues based on your tonality and what you are saying and asking that trigger them to react one of two ways. If you don't know how to do it the right way, they react by throwing up sales resistance and they throw out objections and they try to get rid of you. If you know the right questions to ask that engage them and cause them want to engage, it forces them psychologically to be curious enough where they feel like they have to engage, otherwise they are missing something important. So we have to learn what are those questions and how do we use them and in what way with our tonality. Let's talk a little bit about some of, uh, some of this B2B stuff. So what, what if, in, your, in your advice, what's the number one mistake that's being made by salespeople who are in the B2B space right now? Yeah, I go back to assumptions. Uh, the sellers make an assumption that the buyer needs what they have, Yeah. right? So they go right into pitching mode, yeah. uh, which is super dangerous. And, and another thing in the B2B space is not really comprehending how the decision will be made. Yeah. And, and actually, when you think about it, it, it can be much more complex than the buyer themselves even realize. If, yeah. Because if, if it's something they don't purchase every day or every, every week or every month, every year even, sure. how would they know? Yeah. So you have to be their guide, their coach, their Sherpa, which yeah. is a, a role a lot of salespeople don't take, yeah. but should. You're a, facil a facilitator. Let's talk about when you start talking about your solution truly in the conversation, like you just mentioned, it kills deals. Mm -hmm. In your mind, why is that? Well, because I think for a buyer, you're talking about psychology. I don't have the degree you have, but uh, from my I dropped out my senior year. I'm 13 credits short. I realistically dropped out. I got bored. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Close. But, but, 
Yeah, I think it's like inception. I mean, you, they need to be the one that came to the conclusion that involves you. Mm-hmm. Un- unless they have that uh, realization and, and the feeling that they co-created the solution, it's going to be very tough to sell them on it. And, and you need that consensus in a group of people, most yeah. likely in a B2B sales environment. So yeah, I, I, you have to really sort of build the road to that decision and help them yeah. to do that. You're strictly a facilitator, taking them down that road to help them find problems that they might not have even thought they had, right? Because as you know, you know, by going through some of your materials, most of your prospects don't even know they have a problem when you first talk to them. Or maybe they know a little bit about a problem, but they don't know how bad it is. Or maybe they know it's a problem, but they don't know the potential consequences if they don't do anything about solving it. So your questioning skills allows them in their mind to find problems, like you said, in their mind that they didn't realize they had. And it goes from their, maybe their subconscious to their conscious, and it builds urgency for them to realize like, oh crap, I didn't know about this. And they start to look at you as the expert that almost quote unquote challenged them to be able to figure out that maybe they're not in the best place and where they could be unless they were going with your solution. And we could go a lot more into that. Now, you own this company. I'm one of your customers. You're a tech guy, but yet you write that technology is really not the solution. Why is that? Yeah. Well, at least technology is not the only solution. I, I yeah. think it's, it's like working out. People mm-hmm. won't get sick, uh, a six pack because they buy an ab wheel, right? It's, it's, we want to get that quick fix, sure. but it's, it's not a quick fix. And I think a lot of technology out there today are just, they're just solving one piece of the puzzle, right? Yeah. Let's email more. Okay, if I send 10,000 emails, I should be selling more than if I sell, sell ten, send 10 emails. Sure. Is that true? That's an assumption as well. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of technology out there that promises shortcuts, yeah. but actually make it worse. Like I hate to get these emails like, oh, this is my seventh email. Why haven't you responded, George? <laughs> it's so strange. I haven't responded to my six emails who, that were so funny and great. Sure. Well, I'm not going to respond to them because they suck. Yeah, it's not, it's not the actual email. It's the message of the email, right? That's what's turning it off. It's not necessarily just the email, but your messaging has to be right. Like if you're, you know, I, I interviewed a, a gentleman in the UK a few weeks ago, Daniel Disney, who focuses a lot on LinkedIn and messaging on LinkedIn. And he's like, look, when you get these long messages, as a prospect ourselves, do you ever really read that whole email of four paragraphs when you're really busy and you just got in the office? Probably not, right? It doesn't matter what they say in that email. Like you had mentioned, they're mainly focused on their solution and their pitch and you don't even, you don't even hear it. You don't even read it. You just, it automatically goes in the trash bin, right? Yeah. Yeah, there's a reason for that. And there's so much information about your prospects out there today that it, it's not very hard to just be a bit smart about it and make a very personalized email yeah. that gets read and gets attention. So it's kind of lazy to just spam people. It's very lazy. And, and you've got to focus more on problems in that first email, maybe a, a couple of sentences on problems that they would identify with when they first read the email. And if they're like, oh crap, that's us, or we could be having that problem, it creates in their mind curiosity where they want to engage because you're not focused on your solution. In fact, basically at the end of the email, it's almost like, well, I'm not quite sure I could even help you yet. And you're more detached from that expectation of making a sale. That's important. Now, let's talk about coaching. You talk a lot about in some of your writings that coaching training is so important. In your mind, why is that? That goes back a bit to the previous question as well, that technology is not the solution. People need to get the skills, to have the st- skills needed to, to be effective. And unfortunately, I'm not really seeing that in many cases. So you have to combine training with coaching and technology. And coaching for me is, I mean, that's, that's the key that unlocks people's yeah. growth right? Because you have a, so we have so many limiting beliefs mm-hmm. that a good coach can help you question and, and, and unlock. 
Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm an extremely big believer in having a good coach mm-hmm. that can help you sort of find your path, remove yeah. those barriers and also hold you accountable because mm-hmm. going back to training again, like it's easy to give you like a new year's Eve promise that I'm going to, I'm going to lose X uh, in weight. But unless I have, at least for my sake, I need that trainer to, yeah. to really hold me accountable to yeah. doing yeah. everything that's, Need it. It's so true. You know, we have a motto in the company and, and it, I learned it from one of my mentors, but we talk about is training something you did or is training something that you do? Mm-hmm. If you want to be an elite sales professional or a sales executive, or if your company, if you want to be at the very top of your game and never look back, your salespeople should be training every single day, almost mm-hmm. seven days a week. You know, one thing that a lot of our clients do or or companies that we train, when they interview salespeople, one of the biggest deciding factors is they ask this question. They say, how much money did you invest in sales training outside of what your company spent on training in the last 12 months? And if it's hardly anything, they never hire that person no matter what, because they know they're really not dedicated to the craft. If they're like, well, our company brought in this guy or that guy and they didn't spend any money outside of that. They'll never hire them because they know that their profession is just a job to them. It's not something that they want to be at the very top of their game, right? Yeah. Or maybe you have an assumption that you were born a salesperson and you don't have to (laughs) get any more training. Yeah. I love that part of your book because, you know, a lot of people, I still, I'm still in a maze that people, some people still believe that, that, oh, this guy could sell anything, you know, ice to an Eskimo. Nothing could be further from the truth. If you're a salesperson and and people are always saying you could sell ice to an Eskimo, none of those people are buying from you. They are literally not buying from you. If if you hear these words, you're a great salesperson, 95% of those people that say that to you felt like they were sold and they just don't buy, period. The greatest Mm -hmm. salespeople in the world are where prospects don't feel like you were even a salesperson to them. Yeah. It was like you said, their idea. Now you can help control that by the questions you ask, get them to persuade themselves. It has to be a skilled question. It's not like you just show up and say, hey, persuade yourself. You need to come up with this idea yourself. There has to be certain questions you have to ask that get them to that point. Now, let's talk about sales processes. I know you have a big passion in the sales process. Tell us more about that. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because sales process is one of those words that uh, salespeople in general dislike. Uh, it feels to some people like a straitjacket. But I mean, this comes from, from my previous experiences as well. I think it's kind of weird that in the sales profession, we don't have a sort of think about it as a, a checklist. Like, what do I need to do to go from A to Z with a client? But somehow, again, we, we assume that the salesperson has this in their head. Yeah. And, and that's just stupid because if you look at surgeons or pilots, they use checklists. And I think that's pretty interesting because I, even, I can't even go to the grocery store without a checklist because I'm going to come back home with, I've forgotten something, I have to go back. Yeah. But a salesperson running a 12 to 24 month sales cycle yeah. is doing it without really a very solid sales process in many cases. Yeah. So they, that's they're, just they're madness winging, to me. Yeah, they're winging it, right? So when you're winging it and you don't have a step-by-step sales process where you know like when A happens, B needs to happen next. When B happens, C needs to happen. When C happens, D needs to happen. Yeah. If you don't understand that process, your sales cycle becomes much, much longer. Yep. And the likelihood of that deal closing is much is less, less likely 100% yeah. of the time. Yeah. Now, let's talk a bit, little bit about what's going on with COVID, the pandemic and stuff. Obviously, I have my own thoughts because uh, a lot of clients, you know, when they first come to us, one of their biggest problems is buying decisions are stalling in the marketplace right now for them. What are, why do you think that is first and foremost? Well, I think in a lot of, depending on industry, of course, some industries are just shut down and, and, yeah, and sure. they, they can't do much. But in, in a, when we are uncertain about the future, mm-hmm. we, we're hesitant to make big decisions. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's um, definitely a big, big aspect of this. We see it ourselves. A lot of customers are stalling. But it, it can also be that they just don't realize that not making a decision is also a decision. Yeah. Yeah. So well, that's it's a- so true. A lot of companies, you know, large companies, typically when they're thinking about goal setting, they're projecting two to three years out. 
With the pandemic, most of them are looking at what's going to happen in the next 90 days, right? Yeah. So you as a salesperson, it's easy to get lazy during in selling as far as during times of like economic, you know, expansion. But when we're in a time we're at right now, where we're talking about economic contraction, right? And the economy is going back in, in most places, but an economic contraction, every shortcoming you, the salesperson has will only be magnified will only be brought to the surface mm -hmm. and you'll continue to lose more and more sales for the company unless you can figure out what you're doing wrong and correct that very quickly. What do you think is a question that a, I'm going to bring you back to your selling days. Mm -hmm. What do you think is a good question that a salesperson can ask in the sales process to help build urgency to prevent the uh, customer from stalling? Yeah, that's a really good question to ask <laughs> me about a question. Well, I guess projecting into the future is always interesting. Like yeah. uh, what will happen if you delay this decision yeah. X days yeah. or months? Yeah. Uh, once you're there and you look back, yeah. will, you may, will there be any, any, uh, any thoughts then that you don't have now? Or yeah. just taking yeah. them into the future and having them look back? Yeah, so what you're doing, we call that what's called a consequence question. So you're getting them to think and question their way of thinking that's keeping them in the status quo, whether, whereas they want to be in what we call their future state, right? So that's exactly what you did. Like, John, what are some possible ramifications if your company doesn't do anything about this? Consequence question, you hit it right on the head. I love that. Everybody write down what he just said. Now, what's the biggest thing in your mind from your experience with salespeople in, in different industries, what's the biggest reason that keeps most salespeople from being great? I think the uh, the ability to connect the dots, mm, I like right? understanding their business and how you, you, when you if you can align with that and help them get to a better fe uh, future. Mm -hmm. uh, but in order to do that, in order to be able to connect the dots, you need the business acumen. You need to be able to ask the right questions. So you need a lot of skills there, and it's not about just going into a pitch, right? Yeah. But yeah, connecting the dots and being curious enough about the customer yeah. and their intended outcomes and their intended problems. Yeah. And that's the key, I think. I, I think you're so true. You know, you, you have to start thinking that like a, you have to, well, first of all, you have to stop thinking like a seller and start thinking like a buyer. So stop, you know, I've got a good friend that wrote a book actually taught that. So stop acting like a seller and start thinking like a buyer. And once you start thinking like they think, you become more open to their ideas, their problems, solutions they're looking for. You know, you become what we call a problem finder and problem solver, not a product pusher. And when you go into every sales appointment or call thinking that way, people react to you completely different, right? They don't, they view you more as the expert or the trusted authority, whereas most salespeople they put over here in the corner as just another salesperson trying to stuff their solution down our throat. You yeah. don't want to be over there in that category. That's where 98% of salespeople usually are. Now, what's your advice on how technology, I did want to get around to this question. What's your advice on how technology has impacted sales and the modern selling process specifically? Hopefully. Um, yeah. I mean, what we are trying to do is to make sure that we can bottle up the best behaviors, right? Mm -hmm. So we can really codify our way of, of selling. I think, Unfortunately, technology has led to a lot of spamming, a lot of just doing more of the same and trying to just, you know, hammer pe people into buying your stuff. But yeah. what I would like technology to do is really to drive those behaviors in yeah. order to, as quickly as possible, get on the customer side of the table yeah. and be seen as a, as a team member almost. Yeah, it, selling is collaborative. Sure. Whereas most salespeople have been taught that it's almost like you against the customer yeah. mentality. You, you know, like it's, uh, what's, I'm, I'm looking for a word, the exact opposite of collaborate, adversarial. That's what most people are taught, that selling is adversarial, like you're just out to get your money. Yeah. Nothing could be further from the truth. If you want to be an average salesperson or if you want to jump from job to job to job, treat selling adversarial. That's you against the customer and you're going to bang your head against the wall every day. And you're going to go to bed at night with anxiety that the sale you just made might cancel the next day. Once you do it like we're talking about, it's collaborative and you don't have to worry about that. 
because they've persuaded themselves. Now, let's talk about your company here. So Membrane, I'm a, I'm a client. You talked a little bit about it, but you started that company, I think around eight, nine years ago. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of CRM systems in the world already. Yeah. Why, did you, why did you start this company? Who needs another one? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I agree. No, I started based on those faulty assumptions. And my, 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 the solution I had in my head was if I could only get my salespeople to understand how we sell around here in my, comp my previous company, yeah. uh, in a very effective and guiding and informative and coaching, coachable way, mm -hmm. that would be awesome. And I actually looked at this, all the CRM yeah. systems out there and they sucked. I mean, they were basically <laughs> built on the assumption that everyone should know what to do and just log whatever they did. Yeah. And that, that may be good for the company to have all the records of whatever happened, sure. but it's not very helpful for me as a salesperson. So I wanted a guiding, a system that was more like a, a coach, uh, a Sherpa. That's the reason. Well, hey, you've, you've hit it out of the park. You know, we've heard good things about your company. Uh, we're still paying you, I think, three years later. So something must be good over here on our side. Because I, like I said, I keep seeing, I see all the emails every day, you know, of all these different, you know, people that we use. And I, I always see Membrane every single month because I'm like, Membrane, what does that actually mean? Tell us, what, what, what does Membrane actually mean? Because maybe I don't know. Yeah, that's a, that's a very simple uh, combination of words. So I think a lot of CRMs are good at the memory part remember mm. things yeah. but they're they they're really bad at the intelligence piece okay. and that's the brain so it's just memory and brain put together memory uh, and brain brain i love it all right george hey can't thank you enough for being on here with us any final thoughts or advice for our listeners keep on learning always be learning is one of my my sayings i mean it's if, if you're listening to this you're already on the right track so that's fantastic now, where can our listeners learn more about you and your company? Because maybe they're looking for your services as well. Yeah. So hook up with me on LinkedIn.com. My, my name is easy to find, George Brontian. And go to Membrane.com slash blog to read my blog posts. And uh, there you can find more about Membrane. Okay. All right. If you're a sales professional, executive, business owner, you're looking for that type of service CRM, which I know a lot of you probably are. Heck, probably a lot of you on here are probably already using George's services. George, thanks for being on. It was awesome. I enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. Great Productive fun. conversation. Now, if you're serious about joining the top 1%, I mean the top 1%, and you want to experience more training content just like this, click the links right over there. Right over there, they're exactly what you need to see next. You see, I release new episodes featuring top salespeople and sales authorities, multiple six-figure, high six-figure, even seven-figure earners. And if you're new here, do yourself a favor and smash that subscribe button right below, right below, and join our new Facebook group, Sales Revolution. You see, it's free, and there's a link in the description below just for you. We put it there for you. Finally, I make posts on Facebook and Instagram each and every day with more tips and training. So be sure and follow me and turn on your notifications. So make a comment in the first seven minutes to any of my latest posts Share this episode, and there's a very real chance that you're going to win some killer prizes. And here's the thing. Don't sit on the sidelines. Don't be like everyone else. Get into the game. Join the sales revolution. Stay active. Get involved. Learn the right skills, and we will show you how to take your life and income to a level that most only dream about.